Welcome to the HCI Family of Podcasts, where your source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development. We share our own original research, explore industry trends, and interview executives and thought leaders from across the globe. Join us for practitioner-oriented content around all things leadership, HR, talent management, organizational development, and change management. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with the HCI family of podcasts. Alexandra Bowden, welcome to the conversation today. Thank you, John. Happy to be here. You're joining us from the Cincinnati area. I'm south of Salt Lake City in Utah. And today we're going to be talking about gamifying and operationalizing workplace culture, which is really what your business is all about. So I'm super excited to explore this with you and to get your insights. As we get started, I wanted to share Alexandra's bio with everybody. Alexandra Bowden is a speaker, consultant, partner, educator, and advocate. She has a vision to put customer service and creativity back into the talent equation after a dramatic career pivot of her own and realizing that talent can come from a multitude of places which we aren't tapping into, she founded People First, uh, which is really what we'll be talking about today. Before we dive on in, anything else you would like to share with the audience by way of your background or personal context? Sure. So um, I actually started as, as a lot of people don't know this, but I started as a professional dancer. So I went through a dramatic career pivot of my own. Um, and when I founded People First, my goal was to come at the equation from both sides. So I did career coaching and consulting for others that were trying to go through a big change or either find, you know, the right company or the right role that brought them that joy and satisfaction um, and help them kind of break through the barriers that many companies have. And then also trying to help companies understand how to find and retain top talent um, and do so more effectively. So that's how People First was founded. We've always had, you know, kind of a people equation at the top of mind. And we do everything through the lens of culture and turning into something tangible versus you know, abstract. And maybe if you wouldn't mind just diving in a little bit more into this career pivot, because you're doing something so dramatically different than professional dancing at this point in time, um, just out of curiosity, I'd love to hear a little bit more about that. And then, you know, what, what really inspired you to, to go this different direction? And then we can dig into really the, the ideas of gamifying and operationalizing workplace culture. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it is a different one. So I, Started dancing when I was three um, outside of my sister's ballet class. I think I was the one that really liked it the most. So I did not stop. It was a passion of mine. I knew very early on that that's what I wanted to pursue as my career. Um, And I truly, truly loved what I did. I went to Ohio State. Um, They had one of the top dance programs in the country at the time. And so I got in. I went there, originally a Baltimore native, but that was my introduction to Ohio. Um, And when I graduated, I did a little bit of work abroad, came back, started working in Baltimore and saving for New York City, you know, the big New York City dream. Um, I'd spent summers dancing there in the Joffrey Ballet School, and I really wanted uh, to make a career there. So while I was working, I was working with nonprofits that were help implementing programs in public school systems, particularly for underserved, underserved or underprivileged communities. And so I ended up hiring Um, interviewing and hiring a lot of teachers and working with administrations to make all that work. I found a similar job in New York City when I finally moved there to dance, um, and I really loved that piece. I didn't realize I was kind of doing talent acquisition or people management at the time um, in terms of managing the teachers and the programs as well. But when I eventually realized that, you know, I was working four jobs and still broke and probably couldn't sustain that lifestyle anymore um i had kind of like a quarter life crisis you know i was 25 and i was like well my whole life has been geared towards this one dream and now that i've decided it's not working for me anymore what do i do you know and i had immense college loans so i couldn't really go back to school to study something else i didn't know what i wanted to study if i did um and i was really kind of in a holding pattern i didn't really understand how I was going to find something that I was as passionate about again. 
Um, and that was a very emotional journey as well, because I had only heard of corporate from the arts lens of, you know, soul sucking jobs stuck at a desk. And I had a very different experience of work. So, you know, it was, it was really challenging for me. Um, and what happened was when I moved to Cincinnati, kind of had a breakthrough opportunity. You know, someone took a chance on me, the VP of a big marketing company um, decided to hire me as an executive assistant because I dabbled in, you know, social media and different things. If anyone's worked for a nonprofit, you know that you do a million different jobs that aren't your job description. So that actually helped me in that, in that sense. And um, pretty quickly they were like, oh, we have this recruiting committee. We'd love you to be a co-chair. You have recruiting and hiring background. And I was like, great, let's do it. Um, and that was about three months into starting. And by the end of the year, I'd helped grown and refined the, um, the qualifications and how we hire. They asked me to move into town acquisition full time. And then I grew the department significantly. I got into engagement and retention practices. I got into DE&I. Mm -hmm. Um, and I just found myself really, really passionate about creating these amazing workplaces because someone had taken a chance on me and I didn't believe that work could be fun. Corporate work could be fun in that way. Um, but it allowed me to tap into creativity. The culture was amazing. I thrived in that environment and I wanted other people to have that same experience. So when I left and started my company, um, I pretty much said, you know, how do I recreate this for other people in a way that's tangible and cost effective? Because many of the things that we need to do um, to create great environments for people really is fairly simple. Uh, it's just kind of taking that step and committing to doing it. Well, and thank you for uh, providing more of that background about your own experience and finding your your way into the space. And I, I should just add to, I, I think many listening will resonate with the fact, maybe not dance as a, a previous background, but um, that oftentimes people kind of fall into this space, um, the yeah. HR space, the training and development space, the culture space, the DEI space. Um, people do all sorts of things. And then kind of end up finding their way into this. Now, there are people that also specifically train for and go to school for these areas, um, but there are plenty that take a nonlinear path and and do something similar to what you did. Um, I, I have, you know, nothing related to dance, but, you know, I have a bit of a, a, a meandering path as well to find myself in this space. Um, certainly not a traditional linear path. And, and I think many, many people find themselves in, in that kind of a situation. So I, I, I love to hear these stories because I think it's important for anyone listening, anyone who resonates with these ideas that we're talking about. This is a possibility for you, whether you stay in your current job, in your current organization, and just find ways to, to really champion positive culture and, and all the great aspects that can help you drive team performance and, and, and everything like that and more healthy workplaces, or you decide you want to break out on your own and do consulting work or, or completely transition careers. I think there's a whole bunch of different ways that this can be applied. And I just want to give permission to everybody to do whatever makes sense for them. You know, maybe that is a complete career 180. Uh, maybe it is just honing what you're doing within your current role or, or, or having it complement or supplement what you're doing in your current role to just be a better leader. I think all right. of those are valid and, and I love to see it. I just want more people who are people centric leaders, um, totally regardless agree. of their title, their role, what organization they're in. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's a beautiful point because when I started kind of rebuilding that, that committee, um, I was an executive assistant and I was working with supervisors and directors and I had to gain their buy-in and support. And I grew the committee size like threefold and I was having leaders um, take my direction and turn to me for, you know, how do we do this better? You know, taking my advice. So it's just, you know, I love that you're giving that permission of no matter where you are in an organization, no matter whether you're at the bottom of the totem pole, the top of the totem pole, you can absolutely have an impact if you find something that you're passionate about and you find small ways to to champion it and, and take it on. Yeah, 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 excellent. Well, let's talk now more specifically about what you do um, there at People First and this whole idea around gamifying and operationalizing workplace culture. Um, there's a lot of attention given to this. There's so many books on yes. um, on workplace culture. I think everyone 
I don't know anyone who would say, I don't want to work in a great workplace or anyone, who, right. any leader who thinks I want to have the worst workplace ever. <laughs> like everyone wants a good workplace. Uh, every leader wants to have great teams and a dy- dynamic organization. I think everyone yep. wants that. That's a goal, but the aspirational goal often, you know, we, we don't go anywhere from there. Like it just kind of falls off for a variety of right. reasons. And so this idea of operationalizing culture is really, really essential uh, in my mind. And I love, you know, connecting it with this gamification piece. So tell us a little bit more about that. Sure. So being a, a small business owner myself, I think, um, you know, we're so busy in our day to day. You're right. Nobody wants to have a crappy culture um, and sets out to make people's lives miserable. Um, but the reality is, unless you're intentional about it, it can go a variety of ways. Um, people grow and develop and evolve and change. And your organization is made up of human people. Um, and then you bring new people into the equation, right? So it's it's almost like an organism. It's constantly evolving and changing. So setting it once and hoping that it just happens from there um, is not really a strategy. And we surveyed a bunch of different leaders. We actually surveyed over 250 CEOs. And we had asked them, you know, how important are people to your bottom line? And again, we didn't say how important are people in general or, you know, anything fluff. It's like how much they impact your bottom line and your profitability. And on a scale of um, one to five, it was like a 4.2. Right. So most people agreed they were highly, um, highly translated into profitability and bottom line impact. And then we surveyed them. We said, okay, you know, how many of you have a financial plan? Ninety nine percent. How many of you have a marketing plan? Ninety seven percent. How many of you have a strategic plan? Ninety five percent. How many of you have a people and culture plan? Less than 10 percent. Yeah. And so, you know, there's just a huge gap between, you know, we plan for all these other things. We don't go based on our gut or a whim or hope that it happens. So if we agree that people are hugely impactful to our bottom line and our growth, then we need to plan for that as well. And again, bringing it back, being a small business owner, I understand it's so hard being pulled in so many directions that you might know these things intellectually, but being able to do them and make the time and the space and then having the know-how is a very different thing. So it's really important that you rely on culture leaders internally or you hire someone externally to come in and help you and guide you through that process and hold you accountable um, so that you are making it intentional. Otherwise, it doesn't happen. I think the other piece is the biggest challenge is culture is a buzzword, but it feels very abstract. Right? People are like, great, you know, we have a great culture. Well, what does that mean? What does that look like? And what's your plan for keeping it great as you grow and change and evolve? Um, and many times it boils down to, unfortunately, you know, words on a wall or words on a paper or words in a handbook. But nobody actually is aligned on exactly what that means. Uh, if you ask someone to repeat it for you, they probably couldn't. Right. So we really try to take those next two steps of first using the game as a fun way, you know, engaging way, something that people want to do, not something they just have to do, um, to get people to align around what that culture is. And I'm not just talking vague values that everyone has, you know, integrity, ethics, right? Enron's uh, value was ethics. And clearly people were not operating with that, you know, in mind. So it's about really defining what those things are and agreeing upon them at all levels. So you have the buy-in from everyone because everyone's working together to define those clear behaviors and actions. What we mean by customer service is we go above and beyond. We deliver on time. We give the customer what they need, not just what they ask for, right? It's not that customer is always right, but we want to make sure that, you know, we're giving them excellent service and doing whatever we can going above and beyond um, to help them reach their goals. Right? So you're clearly defining because people would do that a different way. And we've done this with many companies and they all define those things quite differently. And then you're taking those behaviors and you're turning them into habits and actions. You're boiling them down into processes and you're integrating them in everyday life so that they really become like a living, breathing thing within your organization. And it is something tangible and therefore it does impact your people and your bottom line. Yeah. And just making it tangible, going beyond the aspirational, you know, statements and, you know, I'm all for, you know, nice messaging and having nice things on the walls and, and having good messages on your website and, 
you know, messaging is important, but messaging sure. in and of itself is just performative. Like it has to be backed up exactly. by other elements and, and nobody expects you to be perfect either. So we understand that an aspirational goal is just that, like, we're never going to fully achieve it. We're going to work towards it. I think everyone gets that and everyone's willing to be patient with that. But what people aren't patient with, in my experience, is when it's just when you're not walking, try, even attempting to walk the walk at all. It, it's right. it's it's just performative. Um, and people know the difference. They know if if you're espousing key values, if you're trying to work towards them, or if you're just saying them because it sounds good, it's good PR or, or whatever. And and those the, the ways you just described of systematizing and operationalizing um, culture to really have it integrated and embedded throughout the organization, throughout the processes and procedures, the policies of the organization. So it's it's just really... It, it becomes just part of how a business is done. Right. Um, that is what we want to see. And and I think that's yes. that's the hard work of culture because again, as we said at the beginning, most people, I think pretty much everyone wants a good culture. They really right. even aspire to it. Um, but so many places are toxic. So many places don't have that good culture. And it's because people don't know how to or don't go through the hard arduous work of the yes. systemization and the operationalization they just kind yes. of they they hope that they can have a big rah rah meeting and get everyone together and say hey let's you know we love each other and we're going to you know work well together let's collaborate innovate blah 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 they throw out all the terms and then they think we're good it's gonna that's happen. not yeah. that's not how it works like you have to reinforce it repeatedly in many ways yeah. and systematize it and and so it's it's you know i often say it's not rocket science but it is hard because no, hard. you have to be very consistent and you have to be very purposeful in what you're trying to do. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's like, it's like weight loss, right. Or mm -hmm. changing your diet dramatically. It takes time. You have to figure out what are my barriers? What are my challenges? What are my unique, you know, things that are standing in my way of achieving this goal. And it takes small habit changes over time with consistency to start to see that, that benefit. So like anything else in life, you know, we shouldn't be treating culture any differently. And when we go into companies, you brought up an excellent point of people, you know, seeing the effort. It's when we go into companies, many times they bring us in, um, unfortunately, not practically, they bring us in mm -hmm. reactively, like they're bleeding people or they're bleeding money or they're, you know, right. they're not able to grow and they want to grow. Um, and so, they get really stressed and anxious because they want to see change in three months. And it's mm -hmm. like, this is a long process. You know, you're going to see change a year from now. You're going to see a lot more change two years from now. It's something you're continually working towards and doing. It's not a quick fix. However, don't feel desperate because most people end up staying at these clients when you have the intentional and proactive communication with them and the transparency with them of what you're doing to work on it, right? People are more than willing to give you the benefit of the doubt or to hang in there with you most times when they see mm -hmm. you working towards positive change and they know that it's real. Yeah. Um, but you're right. The rah-rah meetings don't work. <laughs> the, the, the post it and forget it doesn't work. Uh, and that's when you start to really lose people's faith in you and, and they start looking for other things because they don't, um, they don't believe that anything's going to change. And that's a really kind of desperate position to be in. Yeah. And it's, it's sad too, because I think when those rah-rah meetings happen, you know, I must, I'm going to give people the benefit of the doubt and assume that it's with good intention, um, sure. that they don't intend for it to just be performative, that they do want to get people excited and they do want to reinforce whatever values they're promoting or whatever. And, and and they can play a part, like as an overarching strategy, you know, around generating interest and buy in and, but then it has to be followed up. And and so when that doesn't happen, you know, I'll give people the benefit of the doubt that maybe they had good intentions in the first place and that they're trying, um, but th they're actually undermining their own ability to drive the type of culture that they want because they're that very act of doing something and not following it up uh, then erodes trust. And, exactly. and, and people just don't believe them anymore. They, they just say, exactly. oh, it's, you know, they, even if it, if it's not meant to be performative, even if it is meant sincerely, people will assign and attribute these, these other nefarious motives and agendas behind what you're doing. And it just erodes trust. And then it's going to make it that much harder for you to try to do something meaningful in the future. So, right. I mean, 
I don't know. You just have to, it has to be part of a broader strategy and you have to share what that strategy is with your people. Like it doesn't need to be done in back rooms, like be open, be transparent, communicate over, over communicate so that people understand what's happening and what they're currently doing and how that fits into everything that's going to be happening. That is the the better recipe for success. Uh, And again, as you've said, as I've said, people will be forgiving. You're going to have missteps. You're going to say things wrong. You're going to do things wrong. That's okay. People know you're not perfect, uh, but they do expect, you know, some concerted effort that you're putting time, energy, resources behind what you say is important. Otherwise they're going to deem it not important. Absolutely. It's um, the communication, the over communication is key to transparency in that process. And many times when we do this with companies, we have the employees coming up to us like, thank you so much. This is so exciting. We love seeing the changes happening. Where we see people fall off the most is in the implementation. And so they get through all the initial work. And again, you know, it's more than just the initial meeting, but they get through the initial work and then the accountability piece. It's like now we're integrating this over the next six months, one year, two years. And they get busy and it falls off. And like you said, you know, it's almost like the fable, the boy who cried wolf. Like the more that you get people excited about something and then you don't deliver, you're eroding that trust. Um, They stop believing. And so when you try to come at it again and then again, even with the best intention of like, well, this time it's going to work, you know, they've stopped believing that it's going to work. So Mm -hmm. they're expecting it to fail. And that's never a good place to be. And I think, you know, Culture is felt, I don't think, I know we've done studies, but culture is felt at the team level. And so, you know, you might have a really small company that doesn't have to do quite as much to -hmm. transmit and translate that culture. Um, But the more that you grow, the more you have facets of the organizations and leaders that are handling things differently. And it's not that leaders can't have their own style, but we still want to have that style under the umbrella of like, this is how we do business, right? This is how we handle customers. This is how we handle our employees. Um, This is how we would handle certain situations because this is what we say that we value. And those things really need to be consistent uh, because those pockets start to develop quite quickly with a growing organization. And so what we do is we try to put tools in people's hands in any way possible, right? You know, we don't try to just be self-serving of like, hey, come hire us and pay us a lot of money to do this for you. Like, yes, we can do that. Um, But we also certify people in playing the game. Uh, If you go to Cards for Culture, game.com. We sell the game as a business tool. We call it a game. It's a business tool, right? (laughs) There's no winner except the person that's buying it. That was a really (laughs) bad dad joke, but, (laughs) (laughs) um, you know, but we try to really like get it in people's hands because again, you know, you can have champions within your company that are, are moving this along and keeping people accountable and keeping it top of mind. So we have, um, challenges that we do every once in a while We're in the matter of like a couple of days or a few hours. We try to disseminate as much information as we can with leaders and CEOs um, and put some, you know, actual tools in their hands. We certify people on how to play the game within their own organizations if they want to do it that way. We're really just trying to get this in people's hands because we want to see a broader change, right? Like we're in this to change the world and the way people work for the better. Um, not just to line our pockets. So however we can get this in people's hands and give them the tools to make it successful is what we're really trying to do. I love that. I love that. Alexandra, this has just been a great conversation. I know at the time I need to let you go here in just a minute, but before we wrap things up for today, I wanted to give you a chance to share with the audience how they can connect with you, find out more about your work, your team, and then give us the final word on the topic for today. Sure. So um, you can connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm on LinkedIn. My um, partner, Melanie Boer, my other partner, Will Crewer, we're always putting out, you know, helpful content. You can find us on our website, um, choosepeoplefirst.com. Like I said, the cardsforculturegame.com. If you want that tool, we have other supplemental decks uh, for recruiting, for wellness. Um, And when it comes to, you know, a, a final leave behind, I would just say, like anything else, don't start tomorrow, start today, right? Because today is probably already too late. I'll just add to that because that's something I feel passionately about. Like, don't wait until you have things perfectly figured out to start. Start, learn, iterate, do better. Like 
that's what we need to do. And so many people get paralyzed and they, they just can't move forward because they're overwhelmed by the scope and scale of like what they envision that needs to happen, that they just don't even start doing the simple things right away. Right. So let's just start doing the simple things. All right, One Alexandra, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. I encourage the audience to reach out, get connected, find out more about what Alexandra and her team can do for you. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week. Thanks for joining us for this episode of the podcast. We hope you stay healthy and safe, and please join us again soon.